my name's Ra, and this is an introductory course in statistics for the psychological sciences. And this is the second part of a four-part lecture series on one-way analysis of variance. So in the first part, we covered you know, the conceptual distinctions between one-way ANOVA and prior tests, like t-tests. And in this video, we're going to dive a little more deeply into the conceptual nature of ANOVA, but we're going to do it by going through step by step what you would do to conduct an ANOVA. In this video, we're going to get all the way from determining the appropriate test all the way down to computing our omnibus F test or F value. In the third video in this lecture, we're going to be looking at how to uh, tease apart what the mean differences are in the event that we have a significant F. And we'll do that either using planned comparisons or by using post hoc tests. We'll also talk about how to write the results up in an APA style format. And then in the fourth part of this lecture, we're going to go through a full computational example of how to conduct a one-way ANOVA problem from beginning to end. Okay, so as always, if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like it and uh, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can get updates on future videos just like this one. And so as always, uh, I'm Rob and I'm going to chill out here and then over here are the PowerPoint slides. And then up here is our virtual whiteboard. We're not going to really be using the virtual whiteboard today because we're going over the conceptual portion uh, of this. Uh, so I'll go ahead and take that away. And uh, so let's begin on one way ANOVA, step by step. So uh, there's as I said, there's kind of two parts to this. Um, we're going to be going over the portion shaded in orange today, uh, beginning with the determining the appropriate statistical, statistical test and then ending in uh, whether or not we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, after that, uh, the next lecture, we're going over the section in blue, which is on how to conduct planned comparisons, post hoc tests, and write up the results in an APA style format. So let's start with determining the appropriate statistical test. So how do you know that you should conduct a one-way ANOVA? Well, uh, the first thing is you need to have a quantitative dependent variable. And in this class, every variable that we talk about is going to be a quantitative dependent variable. Um, the second feature is that you have one qualitative independent variable, meaning, you know, groups with two or more levels. Now, typically you would run a one-way ANOVA if you had three levels or more, uh, because a t-test is typical, is the typical test you would use if you only had two means. Um, however, you can conduct an ANOVA whenever you have just two uh, group means. Uh, in fact, if, if you wanted to try it, you could do a t-test uh, an independent groups t-test and then do a between subjects ANOVA on the exact same means. And if it's two means, t squared is equal to f. You would get the exact same result. So uh, the third thing is you need to determine which type of ANOVA that you're going to conduct. So you're, you're in this situation where there's three different groups that are being compared or three different means. And so you'll know it's a between subjects design if different people are in, at each level of the independent variable. So if we gave group one uh, some kind of treatment and then gave group two, which consisted of different people, another type of treatment, and then we gave group three, another group of different people, a different type of treatment, that's going to be a between subjects design and you would do a one way between subjects ANOVA. However, we can also use a repeated measures design. So if uh, we're measuring the same people at each level of the independent variable, maybe we measure them at baseline before they receive treatment. Maybe we measure them then again after treatment and then again six months uh, follow up after treatment. Um, the same people are being measured at each level of the IV, 
and this would make it a repeated measures design in which you would conduct a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. So the next step is going to be to set up our hypotheses. So the null hypothesis, as before, just says that nothing's going on, that um, there's no differences between the three groups or four groups or five groups, however many levels your IV has. The alternative hypothesis is that something is going on. However, with ANOVA, it doesn't tell you which groups are different from one another. It simply tells you at least one group is different from one other group. So uh, the alternative hypothesis uh, can take a, a variety of different forms. Um, importantly, in ANOVA, because we're dealing with variance, which is the squared value of standard deviation, we, we don't have a negative side of the distribution. So uh, the alternative hypothesis is always going to be non-directional. So one way you can write the null hypothesis is just to spell it out and say group means are all equal. Uh, however, you could use a more computational form where you say mu1, mu2, mu3 are all equal to each other. However, the alternative, if you wanted to take the computational form, can get a little gnarly because it could be any possible combination of means being different from each other. So you can see here that whenever we've got uh, uh, just three levels of an independent variable, there, there would be four different possibilities uh, for an alternative hypothesis. So it's typically easier uh, to si simply just write all group means are not equal for the alternative. And that will be consistent across every single test. Right? You would always write all group means are not equal for your alter alternative hypothesis. Now again, I want to reiterate this because it's very important. A significant F test does not tell you which groups are different from each other. It just tells you that at least one mean is significantly different from one other mean. It could be that all three means are significantly different. We don't know. We have to do a follow-up test in order to tease apart where the differences specifically are between the different levels of the IV. And this is done using either a plan comparison or a post hoc test. And we'll go over that in the next video. Okay, so once we've set up our hypothesis, we have to determine the critical value of our F ratio. And this is F crit, right? Very similar to T crit. However, one distinction is that the degrees of freedom are computed in a different way with ANOVA. So the F value is a ratio of variance explained by the independent variable over variance left unexplained. And so we have a degrees of freedom value for the numerator of that ratio and a degrees of freedom value for the denominator of that ratio. So degrees of freedom for the numerator is k minus 1, and degrees of freedom for the denominator is big N minus k. So what do those represent? Well, k in an ANOVA is the total number of cells in your design. And big N, as always, is the total number of cases or people. Um, so here, if we have the example where we're comparing uh, three, two different or three levels of antidepressant medi medication, Tofranil, Prozac, and placebo, there's three levels. So there's three cells, and K is going to be three and n is going to be the total number of cases. If there's five people in each group, n is going to be 15. So if we had a uh, factorial design, when, you know, we, we had discussed this example in the last video, where we had four levels for our treatment type variable, and two levels for a second independent variable, their veteran status, Right here, we've got a 2 by 4 uh, between subjects design. 2 times 4 is 8, right? There's 8 cells, so k would be equal to 8 in this context. But so going back to our original example, 
We've got Tofranil, Prozac, placebo. There's 15 total people, and there's three levels of the independent variable. So that makes our degrees of freedom between, or for the numerator of our equation, uh, as k minus 1, which is 2. And the degrees of freedom for our denominator is big N minus k, which is 15 minus 3 is 12. So we have degrees of freedom of 2 and 12. So here is a picture of the F distribution. It's Fisher's F ratio. And uh, the shape of this distribution changes based upon the degrees of freedom between and the degrees of freedom within. So uh, the way we denote the degrees of freedom is we have F and then parentheses, and we put our degrees of freedom between, comma, our degrees of freedom within. That is the APA style standard to report an F ratio. And you must always report the degrees of freedom between and within for your F test. So here's a, a distribution of F where the degrees of freedom are 3 and 16. And again, the more people we have, the more it's going to affect those degrees of freedom and the more it's going to shift the shape of the F distribution. And so here is an F distribution with four degrees of freedom between and 20 de degrees of freedom within. And you can see, you know, we're finding this area in the tail that represents 5%. Um, we're setting alpha at 0.05, obviously. And, and we're finding that line in the sand that uh, denotes the F critical value um, that cuts off 5% in that tail. Now, an important thing is you may notice that this distribution is asymmetrical. Uh, this is because we're using variance, right? It is a squared value. There's no negative value, um, no negative end of the distribution for an F distribution, um, which that's a big difference from, uh, from the normal distribution or T distribution. So, okay, we have a test here with degrees of freedom uh, of 2 and 12. So we, to, to get the critical value, we need to look up the F distribution table. We're going to have a lot of tables in this class. Okay, so we do that by plugging in the degrees of freedom values for the numerator and the denominator. So the numerator is the between subjects variance. And that's going to be this D1 top row. And we had two. And then the degrees of freedom for the denominator, um, the variance unexplained, is big N minus K. We had 12. So we look up 2 and 12. They intersect at 3.89. And that would be the critical value of F for this test. The next thing we have to do is set up the decision rule for our hypothesis test. This is much easier because we don't have directionality. It's always going to be reject the null if f obtained is greater than or equal to the f critical value. And again, I'm going to say this one more time, <laughs> sounding like a broken record, a significant f value does not tell you where the difference between means is. It tells you that you need to investigate more. It tells you that something is going on, at least one mean is significantly different from one other mean. Okay, so after we've uh, set our decision rule, determined our critical value, then we need to go in and compute the obtained value of F and an effect size measure. So here's our example data all laid out in raw form. We can see we have different people in each group, and uh, each group contains five people. So and that means that big N is 15, and little n for each group is five. And so importantly, what we're doing here, we're not, we're not evaluating the means yet. We're looking, we're partialing out variance into variance explained versus variance unexplained. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how this is actually working under the hood.
So keep in mind, variance is just the squared version of the standard deviation. It tells us how scores, how the, the, the degree to which scores tend to vary around the mean. And so within group variance, this is our denominator, the variance unexplained, uh, it, it can be comprised of, of numerous sources. It could be individual differences. So people may have entered the experiment with different backgrounds or abilities or attitudes or, or, or anything, health, you know, health, different levels of health. Um, and then there's experimental error. That could be a source of unexplained variance. So no measure that we give is going to be absolutely perfect. And that means that anytime we make a measurement, it's gonna have some degree of error. We could have really poor equipment, the, the researcher who's taking the measure might not be paying attention as well as they should. Um, people may be doing the procedure in different ways. Uh, and all of this is going to lead to additional error. And so these sources of error are captured by our within group variance. Within group variance is showing us what is unexplained due to individual differences and due to experimental error. Now between group variance, it also measures individual differences and it measures experimental error, but it also contains the treatment effect. In other words, how do the different levels of the independent variable, how much do, does the difference between the levels of the individual, in, independent variable explain differences in the dependent variable? So between group variance is a treatment effect plus individual differences, plus experimental error. And when we look at that equation, right, the individual differences plus error cancel out in the numerator and the denominator. And what's left is the treatment effect. Okay, so let's look a little more in, in, in more detail about how you compute these measures of explained and unexplained variance. So within group variance, the variance unexplained, right, is an estimate of the null population variance. And it's based on the variability within each group, right? So it tells us how large the differences are between the scores within one level of the independent variable and that group's mean. And uh, this estimate is essentially a sum of squared values divided by the degrees of freedom. And this gives us an estimate of the population, very similar to with a t-test where we had a mean difference and we divided by the sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom or, uh, you know, uh, same way. Except here we're working with variance. So our estimate of the within subjects variance is called the mean square within. You, so I'm gonna go back here. So you can see right here, we've plotted out the depression symptoms for each of the values in this Toffernal group. And what we're doing is we're assessing how the degree to which they vary around the mean of the people in the Toffernal group. So this is the within subject variance, right? The within groups variance. The between groups variance, which is the, the variable that contains our explained variance from the IV, it tells us how large the differences are between the means of each group. So rather than looking within each group, we're looking at how those groups vary from each other. And so here you can see we're plotting the mean of Toffrino and Prozac and placebo and seeing how those means of each group vary in relation to the grand mean. Okay, so now that we have that kind of conceptual distinction down, what is the F ratio? Well, we've said over and over, it is the variance between or the ex variance explained by the independent variable divided by the variability within the variance left unexplained 
And so the way we compute this is f is equal to mean square between over mean square within. Those are simply estimates of the within and the between group population variance. Those estimates are based off of sum of squares values, sum of squares very similar to what we computed before with sum of squares, divided by the degrees of freedom for their respective, uh, whether it's between or within. Now, an easy way to kind of uh, approach computing the F ratio is using what's called an ANOVA summary table. Anytime you run an ANOVA in SPSS, you're going to get a summary table like this, or an R, or in SAS, whatever statistical package you use. This is pretty standard. And so what this table does is it shows a different column for each stage of the computation. So we'll have our sum of squares value for the sample uh, between the sample within, and then the total sum of squares. And then we have the degrees of freedom for between, the degrees of freedom for within, and the total degrees of freedom. Now, is it necessary to compute the total? No, it's not. But I'm going to encourage you to always do this. And the reason is because it's very simple to make a computational error when computing a sum of squares between or a sum of squares within. However, if you add up the sum of squares between and the sum of squares within, it should always equal the sum of squares total. And so you can compute between, compute within, and then compute total, and see if your between plus your within value are equivalent to the total value you computed. If they're not, you may have made a mistake somewhere and should go back and correct it. Uh, but it, you know, and this is a particularly important step because it is the starting point for the F computation. If the sum of squares between or within is computed with an error, it's going to throw the rest of the, the calculations off. So once we've computed sum of squares between and within in total, then we're going to compute our degrees of freedom. So as we mentioned before, degrees of freedom is k minus 1, and within is n minus k. And the total degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So you can do this same check for your degrees of freedom value. You should be able to take your uh, degrees of freedom between, degrees of freedom within, and they should sum to n minus 1. After this, to get your mean square between, you just divide mean square between by degrees of freedom. Same thing with your, uh, your mean square within. Now again, this mean square value is our estimate of the population from our sample data. After we have our mean square between and within value, we then can just divide mean square between by mean square within to get our F ratio. So once we have our F ratio, we need to conduct our measure of effect size. We want to know what the magnitude of this effect is. And this, uh, the effect size measures for ANOVA are very similar to what we had when we studied correlation, when we looked at R squared. And that means that R squared or, or our effect sizes for ANOVA, it represents the proportion of variance in the dependent variable that is explained by the independent variable. So for example, in our, in our example with uh, Toffernil, Prozac, and Placebo, if we had an effect size of, say, 0 0.10, right? This would mean that 10% of the variability in depression symptoms are explained by the treatment type, right? So um, it's a very, uh, it's easy to understand what the magnitude is. I mean, we want to explain the reason people change in their depression symptoms. And this effect size really gives us a good handle on um, the magnitude of an effect. So there's two primary, uh, I mean, there's many versions, but the two we're going to go over in this class are uh, 
omega squared and eta squared. So omega squared is a slightly more accurate estimate of effect size. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not too bad, but it's a little more computationally complex. It takes in degrees of freedom and the such. However, um, eta squared it tends to be less accurate. I do tend to see this reported more in uh, published literature. It's simply, the eta squared value is simply sum of squares between over sum of squares total. Um, and so it's a slightly less accurate. Uh, it, it's more likely to lead to inflated estimates because it doesn't include uh, degrees of freedom markers. Okay, and then you when, once you have computed an eta squared or an omega squared, you're going to interpret it based on whether it's small, medium, or large uh, using the following values below. Okay, so the next step is we need to determine whether or not we should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And to do this, we just base it off of the decision rule we created uh, in step four. So the decision rule is always going to be reject the null if f obtained is greater than or equal to f crit. Now, so what is it? What is the shape an f value should kind of take? Well, um, because if you look at the f ratio and we see that it's the variance uh, over the variance and those cancel each other out, um, we would expect if we didn't have any independent variable effects that the f value is going to approximate 1. However, if the null hypothesis is false, we're going to expect f to be much larger than 1. OK, so now what does a significant f ratio mean? It means that at least one of the group means is significantly different from one of the other group means. The f ratio does not tell us which group means are different. So you can see here, it could be that Toffronil is different from Prozac. It could be that Toffronil is different from placebo. It could be that Prozac is different from placebo. It could be any combination of means that are different. So in other words, so the F ratio, it's commonly called an omnibus effect. And what omnibus, it's kind of like an overarching, it's like a spotlight that says, you know, should we investigate further? If, the, if, if something is detected, we need to dig in and see what is significantly different from uh, what else. So essentially the omnibus F ratio tells us that something is going on. There is at least one significant difference between group means and we need to conduct a post hoc test or a planned comparison test to investigate further and actually learn something from the data. If you did not have a significant F, it would mean there's no differences, don't bother. Okay, so um, we've gone through steps one through six in this video. In the next video, we're going to go in and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, how to conduct the, the follow-up, the post hoc or planned comparison tests, and then how to write up the results in APA style format. So I hope you found this uh, lecture helpful, and I look forward to sharing with you how to do the post hoc tests in the next video. Again, if you liked it, uh, if you liked the video, don't forget to like it, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and I'll see you soon. Okay, thank you.